Crusader Kings 3 has come a long way since those early days back in 2020, but despite fleshing out systems here and adding completely new ones over there, we're likely nowhere near the end point of CK3 development. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we were looking at another 4 to 7 years of development time here, seeing as CK3 is doing really well in terms of player numbers and judging by its sister games like EU4 and Hearts of Iron 4. So let's get right to the point and talk about the 7 most important features CK3 needs to receive before the end. Number 1. Actual Systems of Law With Rules to Power and the new Administrative Realm system, we received a new form of government where governors and how they govern changed drastically. It felt like the power struggles and delegation of ruling a realm was finally put into system, in a way that even surpassed the imperial government systems of CK2. The theme administration mechanics and the directives allow a ruler or governor to change up how they rule and which part of governing they focus on, and take on a pseudo-edict type form. But still, it's rather far away from being a true law system. You see, CK3's version of laws are essentially just two simple systems. Succession laws, which naturally only govern the nature of succession for a specific title, and Crown Authority, an arguably much more encompassing system that once unlocked, enables a bunch of features or modifiers at once, including vassal and title revocation. What's more is that features like the ability of women to hold offices or certain types of jobs is actually directly dictated by your religion in CK3, which means that religious reform of some kind is necessary to change how those things work. Of course, in CK2, this was not the case. Here, every realm had access to a wide variety of laws that applied to each specific realm, and the laws dictated everything from the legality of an action or situation to the power of certain acts or the reach of the realm's different actors. Indeed, CK2 had a specific Crown Authority law which determined which laws could be changed, instead of doing it the CK3 way, where Crown Authority automatically enables a bunch of features when unlocked. In my opinion, laws add an immense amount of depth to governing a realm, and despite feeling like not a lot of people talk about laws all that much, it was one of my favorite aspects of CK2, because you really felt as though each realm could be customized to your liking in an immersive way, that your kingdom advanced throughout the ages based on a gradual modernization or centralization of laws, and that instead of just clicking a big shiny icon, that the path forward and powers you wanted were available in a more granular and sensible way. In other words, laws need to make a comeback to CK for the ultimate experience, especially considering that lawmaking was an integral part of the medieval world. And before we move on, I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about Instant Gaming. Instant Gaming is a popular service that offers both upcoming, brand new and older titles at great discounts, and I love using it myself to save on various games of all genres. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by following my link below and save tons of money on games you'd otherwise spend a lot more on elsewhere, like let's say Crusader Kings 3. And now, back to CK3. Number 2. The Conclave or Meaningful Councils Something I still love so much about CK2 is the fact that even though you might be the person in charge, you rarely wield absolute power. In the feudal system especially, your council members wield actual power alongside you, in that you need the majority of your council to vote with you on changes to the law. Votes could be given freely from the members if they liked you or had a favorable disposition, but they could also be bought with money or exploited with hooks. Powerful council members meant that you weren't just free to increase your crown authority or other laws in the realm, but that you had to take into account your influential vassals, and in this way, simulated a type of power sharing or decentralized system of governance where this was the case. Indeed, if you made enough headway and centralized the realm enough, you could even abolish the council to completely centralize the realm in the ruler's hands and enact the laws you wanted whenever you wanted. Of course, as long as the council actually voted to dissolve itself. In other words, while I do appreciate that we have a council to begin with, at this time, I think it's nowhere near as immersive nor as fun and complex as it could be, and I hope that Paradox in the near future sets out to bring more variety and features related to the council members and their interactivity with the king, in conjunction with a major law system overhaul. Number 3. Actual Navies One of my most despised trends of the past decade or so of strategy game development is the tendency to completely invalidate and remove the need for navies. In CK3, whenever you wish to take your army overseas, all you have to do is wait a few weeks and pay a sum to have them essentially build their own temporary navy, a navy that doesn't just magically appear, but which also magically disappears after you've gone ashore, which must then be quote-unquote built and then paid for again if you wish to go to sea once more. And if two navies from warring factions meet each other on the high seas, nothing happens, since naval battles and skirmishes are non-existent. If you've only played CK3 or never played CK2, I can understand why this doesn't 
immediately bothered you. But CK3 is the sign here is actually a radical departure from every other Paradox game. Because yes, while CK2 featured naval building but not naval battles, every game from EU4 to Victoria 2 and 3 to Hearts of Iron 4 and Imperator Rome, all of these games feature both land and naval warfare. Heck, even Imperator Rome features the raising of specific naval units who can both transport your armies and battle against other navies on the seas. CK3 then pretty much stands alone among Paradox catalog of games who offers great variety on both land and sea. And while I will admit that navy management in CK2 was pretty demanding since you potentially spawned tiny navies in every region where you had a navy, I imagine CK3's naval raising would function similarly to how the armies rally in CK3, so it would no longer really be a hassle to do so. And and I think that with navies, it would finally feel risky or dangerous to traverse the seas, and it would add so much to the game to be able to truly unleash the power of historical naval powers. Number 4. Trade Perhaps the biggest glaring missing feature from CK3 is trade. Trade is usually a quintessential feature of strategy games of a certain depth, where goods either internally in a kingdom or between kingdoms can be traded, either for new resources or for a boost or decline in income. The fact that CK3 doesn't feature trade at all is quite strange actually, seeing as the control of resources and important regions was as vital for the power of rulers then as it is now. Trade in CK3 could take on a few different shapes I think. We could either have it purely resource based where you suddenly needed a certain type of good to be able to raise buildings or armies, but this could make things a bit too complicated. So perhaps it would be better to instead do what EU4 or Wiki3 have done and place specific goods in certain regions and then have those goods be traded automatically on a global market, where everything is measured in pure and simple gold. This could include adding major trade networks like the Silk Road for example, and by building market hubs or upgrading the local infrastructure, you could attempt to increase the trade significance of your towns and empires as a whole. Negotiating trade privileges with other kingdoms could increase ties and economic growth for both realms, and the inclusion of a taxation or toll system would also help to increase the immersion and depth of international trade. I think this would be awesome, and it would be great to see historical trade networks shine like they did back then or create entirely new ones if you have the power to do so. Number 5. Republics Adding new ways of playing CK3 is probably what I like the most about Paradox's DLCs for this game, and Rose to Power was a great example of that. But one way of playing CK3 that's never returned just yet is as Republics, or rather, as Republican rulers. You see, the thing about Republics is that they're built on different succession structures than feudal realms, or realms where the main titles pass from parent to child. Italian Republics differed in their systems, but many of them did include a system of voting by councils, and some form of a nobility of powerful upper classes. In other words, Paradox would have to create a new form of government for this to work, but they do have experience with this from the past of course. Whether we are talking republics in CK2, republics in EU4, the brand new administrative realm system or different succession and taxation systems for say feudal and clan realms, Paradox absolutely has the know-how and expertise to create a new republican system of governance, they just need to do it. And frankly, I think that both the trade overhaul and the navy overhaul we mentioned before could go very well alongside a republic like an expansion. Number 6. City Sprawl and Map Immersion For a game whose visuals generally leave little to be desired, CK3 cities and castles always stood out as eyesores to me. Don't get me wrong, they're not directly ugly or anything, but the fact that the models basically stay the same for the most part throughout the game is a big disappointment. Because whereas other Paradox games actually feature the enlargement of cities as you continue playing and expanding them, like for example in Imperator Rome or Victoria 3, CK3s are essentially frozen in time. There are no extra houses added, no new castles or markets, new towers or ports. There's further no visible life happening on the map except for some animal life in the form of birds and such, but I'd love to see trade carts moving about, new army models that actually resembled armies or indeed, if there was a war going on, signs of battle or a very toned down version of the system in Victoria 3, just to show off the toll of war in the regions affected. And of course, I'd love to have a replacement for the traveling model, who now looks like some rando in rags, which doesn't really feel right if you're a king or an emperor. The most important of these do remain the cities though, whose visual flair leaves a lot to be desired. But I do think things like trade cards could go well with a trade update, especially on important trade network roads if those were ever implemented. And number 7, Revamped Catholicism. I think a major thing that CK3 is still lacking is a true Catholic experience with a proper cardinal system and its interconnectedness with the kingdoms of Europe and importantly the Holy Roman Empire. 
Both CK2 and EU4 have cardinal systems. EU4 even has an explicit system for the Holy Roman Empire, and CK2 offers both a cardinal election system and royal coronations tied to the papacy, which brings the power and importance of the church closer to where it should be. Right now, I find the papal system in CK3 quite underwhelming to be frank, and a revamp in this area would go a long way to bring some more religious immersion to Catholic rulers. Those were my 7 most wanted features for CK3, and it remains to be seen if any of them will be fulfilled. Let me know which ones you agree the most with, and tell me which features you'd like to see the most in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, make sure to follow my link below and buy your next game at a massive discount on Instant Gaming, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!